On January 20th, 2009, this was the scene outside the Capitol building in Washington, D.C. It is estimated that 1.8 million people gathered to witness the first black president get sworn into office. Even the sun peeked through the thin clouds to see history made. Now, fast forward to January 20th, 2017, to the inauguration of the 45th president. Let's look at those side-by-side -side photos. Eight years ago, the parade route was packed with onlookers. And this year, well, it was... Empty. Wow, sir. Empty. Let's go a little further. A uh, few people. Uh, let's go a little further. Empty. And empty. While there has been great debate and alternative facts as to how many people actually attended the inauguration this year, pause. For those of you who don't know what an alternative fact is, apparently it's a new colloquialism for lie. Anyway, back to what I was saying. It is estimated that between 250,000 to 600,000 were in attendance. These numbers, the president readily argued, were too low because to him it looked like a, and I quote, million to million and a half, and quoting again, went all the way back to the Washington Monument, unquote. Since numbers are in the eye of the beholder, it could have very well looked like that to him because of his vantage point, as one media outlet pointed out. So let's take a look at the two inaugurations from the same vantage point. This is Obama's, and this is Trump. Now, in all fairness, the figures could be wrong because they definitely got it wrong before <coughs> that million man march. So let me offer you some concrete numbers. The Washington Area Transit Authority reported that Trump's inauguration prompted about 570,000 trips in the system that day, while Obama's drew in 1.1 million trips, the highest in its history. Can you guess what drew in the second at about 1 million rail trips? No, not Obama's second inauguration. Good guess, though. It was actually the event that took place the day after Trump's inauguration, the Women's March on Washington. Yes, on January 21st, hundreds of thousands of women and some men gathered in Washington to rally against the new president. I guess that explains that lackluster attendance for the inauguration. It is reported that the march drew about three times as many people as Trump's inauguration, and the marchers didn't just go all the way back to the National Monument, but it spread to cities across the country, including Chicago, New York, Los Angeles, Boston, Atlanta, Denver, Phoenix. It spread worldwide to Sydney, Berlin, London, Paris, Nairobi, and Cape Town, making it the biggest march in history. So why did women of all ages and races feel called to this massive act of solidarity? Today is an act of resistance. We are the majority. It is a serious problem when we have members of our military denigrating female Marines who will give their life to this country. I am surprised that the words of Coretta Scott King are not suitable for debate. That's quite a list, and all of the issues on it are equally important and deserve to be addressed. But on this Youth Channel special, we are going to discuss reproductive rights and what's at stake in the Trump era. Here with me to unpack this issue is social justice lawyer Elizabeth Hira, who serves on the board of directors of the New York Abortion Access Fund. Most recently, she advised the Center for Reproductive Rights on Legal and policy strategy to advance reproductive rights over the long term and as an associate at Civitas Public Affairs Group in New York. She supported strategic advocacy to abolish the death penalty nationally and forward LGBT non-discrimination policies at the state and federal level, combating discriminatory religious practices and advancing reproductive justice. During law school, Elizabeth worked to protect civil liberties with the Brennan Center for Justice to ensure child labor prohibitions in World Bank projects with the personal office of Senator Tom Harkin. And she advocated for women's rights internationally in South Africa and Uganda. And thank you, Ms. Hero, for coming on the program today. Well, as I mentioned in the intro, you are on the board of directors for NIAF, the New York Abortion Access Fund. Mm -hmm. So first, tell us a little bit about this organization and how you became involved. 
So the New York Abortion Access Fund is a New York-based organization. We are all volunteer um, run, and so we have a group of about 80 people who volunteer to man our hotlines, and there uh, are formerly eight and now 16 of us, or 15 of us, who are on the actual board of directors. What the New York Abortion Access Fund does is provide funds for people who are either from New York or traveling to New York to have abortions, and it's as simple as that. Um, I think a lot of people don't realize that abortion services are not are sometimes prohibitively expensive for folks, mm -hmm. and so what we do is if you need help to fund your abortion, you call us. Um, we have three hotlines that run across the entire state of New York. There is a uh, uh, service inside of New York City, outside of New York City, um, and a Spanish-speaking hotline as well. So you call us and kind of no questions asked, we work with you to figure out how we can um, aid you in funding to be able mm -hmm. to receive the services that you need. Okay. And as a social justice lawyer, you have championed many causes, including abolishing the death penalty, equal rights for the LGBTQ community, mm -hmm. and reproductive justice. Mm -hmm. What are some injustices against reproductive rights that made you join this cause? Oh, geez. I... I think that when we talk about reproductive justice, you don't even need to mm -hmm. wake up and say, well, I care about women's issues, and that's why I've joined the fight. I think for me in particular, what I was struck by was just inequality for for women, mm -hmm. and I think for people who are trying to access reproductive health care, that was just unacceptable. Um, and I think particularly, I'm an immigrant, I'm from the Caribbean, I am for that reason, I think especially proud to be in a country that values equality as a a core tenet of who we are and what we believe in and to see really basic things that I think we should take for granted about things like autonomy, like control over our own bodies, about mm -hmm. the decisions that we make with our lives. Um, those seem like pretty fundamental things that every American should be able to decide for themselves. And so I think I became involved in reproductive rights um, and reproductive justice broadly because I was shocked at the level of the discourse that we were having mm -hmm. that was basically justifying um, control over other people that didn't seem like it really jived with the way that we view ourselves as Americans. Mm -hmm. um, actually, my background is in, in international human rights, so I started particularly women working with um, women in all, all around the world. My clinical work uh, when I was at Georgetown was in Uganda, and it was amazing to me at the time that I was doing that work in Uganda, um, I would be sitting down with students, college students like yourself or high school students and yeah. saying, uh, you know, this is the work that we're working on, uh, particularly with abortion rights and contraceptive access. And at the time that I was having those conversations, they would say to me, hey, we've been reading in the Times or in the paper that we have uh, here, because we all have internet access, we're reading many of the same papers around the globe. And they're saying you guys are having a lot of trouble with your your women in your country being able to get contraceptive access. Mm -hmm. And particularly, again, as an American but as an immigrant, I was just struck by the fact that this conversation we often think of as a global conversation for people who are marginalized is equally relevant in our own country. And I thought that was unacceptable and it was important to mm -hmm. work on it at home. Okay. So that brings me to my legal work but also to our work with NIAF. All right. So straight into the topic of reproductive rights and abortion. Mm -hmm. It's safe to say that you're pro-choice. Yes. Yeah. So my question was, under any circumstance, do you sympathize with the other side on any of their points? Oh, I sympathize. I think it's really important, especially given the place that we're in, mm -hmm. to be able to have dialogue about what that actually yeah. means. Um, I think I, on any issue that's difficult, it's really important to recognize that wherever someone is coming from, they're coming from mm -hmm. for a reason. Uh, I don't believe that we should have no dialogue about this. In yeah. fact, I think we should increase dialogue about it. And I actually think it's really important to understand that and this is speaking in my own personal capacity, not yeah. in that of my organization. Mm -hmm. For my organization, we don't ask questions about why you're doing what you're doing. The yeah. point is that you have bodily autonomy. For the question of dialogue, though, I think it's really important that we develop beyond this really old paradigm of you are either pro-choice or pro-life. What we're actually seeing in a lot of data that we get more recently is that America, 69% of Americans do not support the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which mm -hmm. is an important con a case, a yeah. Supreme Court case that gives us the constitutional right to abortion. That is very different than asking the question about would you personally have an abortion? And I mm -hmm. think it's really important that we open the dialogue because a lot of people that would maybe not personally choose to have an abortion still respect the rights of other people to have an abortion. So I think when you ask the question about whether I'm pro-choice, I am definitely pro-choice, yeah. but I think it's important to open up the dialogue beyond mm -hmm. whether one falls on one side or another of that issue. And I think that it's interesting that you say that because a lot of times we tend to stay like stuck to our own perspective, so it's good to see that we can meet in the middle and try to acknowledge where the other side is coming from mm -hmm. and a lot of the issues. So yeah. it's the important first step to creating a dialogue. There. Yeah. Well, respect is the baseline, mm -hmm. right? So if I can just respect that you're coming from your, from your opinion for a reason, mm -hmm. that makes it a lot easier for us to understand and actually come to a place mm -hmm. that we might both agree on. Yes. 
So this is not the first and probably not the last pro-life president in office, mm -hmm. but this one, Donald Trump, is touted as being one of the most vocal about his pro-life positions. Mm -hmm. Are you alarmed uh, about Donald Trump like being this vocal, or do you think this was a ploy to win the votes of anti-abortionists? Again, answering only in my personal capacity, not yeah. from my organization. Mm -hmm. um, I think, am I alarmed by Donald Trump's yeah, do you, are you, yeah. It's really important to note that Donald Trump used to be a Democrat and used to mm -hmm. be pro-choice and often seems to have taken positions on issues like, let's say, uh, you know, transgender bathroom bills, mm -hmm. 180 degrees from where he's taken them based on polling that comes through later. So yeah. to speak to his own convictions, I don't actually know what's in mm -hmm. what is in his heart or often what comes out of his mouth changes from day to day. I think that's quite different um, than what actually ends up happening in policy. And I'm sure we'll talk a lot about what those policies will look like. I think the thing to be very aware of is that his culture of flippancy or his, his flippancy about issues that particularly relate to reproductive justice have created a culture where other people feel free to say things that maybe they may not have been comfortable saying before. Okay. So you see things like we had a recent, uh, I think it was an Oklahoma state legislator who mm -hmm. was talking about abortion rights and specifically was like a woman who becomes pregnant should know that she is a host. And I think the idea of being like, I'm gonna stop talking about you as an autonomous entity with rights and instead refer to you as a host is not the kind of thing we would have expected to hear under whether it was President Reagan or President Obama, honestly, that idea that like you're just an incubator. So to create a climate um, because of the way that you talk about women, whether you justify your sexual assault against them or anything that might come out of your mouth, um, is a dangerous thing for you to set the tone with as president. Okay. Does that answer your question? Yeah, okay. it, it gets in there. So one of the things that the president did once he took office was reinstate the Mexico City policy. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, just to get a little bit of background for our viewers, it bans the government from funding organizations abroad that have anything to do with abortion, organizations like International Planned Parenthood. Mm -hmm. Now, the Mexico City policy has gone back and forth between administrations since it was first introduced in 1984. So do you think that Trump reinstating it was just a political move, or do you feel, again, this is from your personal view, mm -hmm. that this is a conviction of his? Okay, so I think to back up a little bit, there are two ways that we talk about the Mexico City policy. Okay. So instituted in 1984, indeed, um, what it specifically applied to was the U.S. funding, uh, impacts U.S. funding for family planning programs. What's yeah. important to note, and some, uh, some experts are looking into this and have interpreted it to uh, find that Trump's administration's version of the Mexico City policy, which uh, some activists call the global gag rule, is mm -hmm. actually more expansive than the one that we were looking at in 1984. Mm -hmm. So even though basically we've seen a pendulum, that Democrats and Republicans, depending on who's in office, will always come in and one of the first things they do is either rescind or sign back into, into effect the Mexico City policy. We call it the global gag rule um, because it actually, it's not just about you providing funding for abortions. Yeah. American federal taxpayer dollars are never used for abortion funding abroad or in the United States. And okay. that's because of the Hyde Amendment, which we can talk about later if mm -hmm. you want to. Um, but it is important to understand that it's literally, if you and I are, we're talking about, let's say HIV, and yeah. we are in a country that gets United States dollars. Mm -hmm. um, if you say to me, you're a doctor, I'm a pregnant woman, and I say, what's my set of options? I am HIV positive, and I, I feel uncomfortable with this pregnancy because I don't want to transmit this to my child. Yeah. If you say, you can have the baby, you can adopt, uh, you can give the baby away for adoption, or you can abort, the fact of you telling it me that, the, that abortion is a possibility puts your funding from the United States in jeopardy. So it's not like you're saying, I will provide this abortion, give mm -hmm. you this care. It's even discussion of abortion mm -hmm. as a possibility. Um, and so that's why we call it the global gag rule. But yeah. I think it's an important thing to understand that it's not that we're, we're forcing people to have abortions or even providing the procedure. It's the idea, like we talked about earlier, if you and I have a dialogue, yeah. that itself is mm -hmm. considered dangerous under, under the global gag rule. Um, so I just wanted to give yeah. that, that bit And with the Mexico on. City policy, do you think that United States tax dollars should be like supporting family planning outside of its borders? I think it is important to be judicious about what United States dollars go to mm -hmm. at all, okay. right? But I also think we have to think about what objectives are. So for instance, uh, talking about whether you want to call it the Mexico City policy or the global gag rule, mm -hmm. um, there's a study out of Stanford University with 20 sub-Saharan African countries. Let's say the reason that we have the global gag rule is because we want to reduce the incidence of abortion, right? Yeah. The global gag rule's effect 
is, uh, according to the Stanford study, mm -hmm. um, is actually to increase the rate of abortion because you and I at a clinic, you having that discussion with me about birth control, if your clinic ever discusses abortion in another context, you lose your funding as a clinic. Okay. Which means the rest of my community that would have come to you for birth control no longer has access to birth control. With lesser access to birth control, we're gonna have higher incidences of abortion. Mm -hmm. And often, at least from the clinical work that I've done, I'm speaking only to Uganda, uh, we are gonna see higher incidences of unsafe abortion rather than mm -hmm. lower incidence of abortion across the board. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's kind of like reducing birth control actually raises the unsafe abortion mm -hmm. rate rather than lowering abortion across the board. So the reason I bring that up is mm -hmm. it doesn't matter what my opinion personally is about yeah. how we should spend tax dollars, it's let's be effective about the objectives we're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. So if we're trying to reduce abortions, the thing that's not that's the least helpful to reduce abortions is to reduce the amount of support we actually give to information and access okay. to contraception. And what impact has the reinstatement of this policy had in the past? So it, it's exactly the Stanford study. Um, yeah. So that uh, looking at particularly 20 sub-Saharan African countries, and I think it was p written about in the Times this year, okay. what we have seen is that incidences of abortion increase as a result of the reinstatement of the Mexico City policy. Mm -hmm. And the US president has also threatened to defund Planned Parenthood in the United States. In response to this, Planned Parenthood launched a full-blown campaign to protest against this. Do you think that their reaction was appropriate given that presidents always say things to get into office mm -hmm. but don't necessarily do it once they get there? Again, this is a question about climate. So regardless yeah. of what President Trump is going to do, or and again, he is th I think it's mm -hmm. really important. This is a good time to step back and think of like the president has executive power. Yeah. What's fantastic and what makes America a great democracy is that there are three branches of government. Mm -hmm. So there's the judicial branch, the executive branch, and the legislative branch. President Trump alone does not have the power that Congress mm -hmm. or even a state legislature has to be able to change what funding policies are across yeah. the board. Um, and so to your question, the way that funding works for Planned Parenthood currently, because mm -hmm. of this thing called the Hyde Amendment, yeah. which we can talk about later if you want, mm -hmm. the quick and dirty version of this is that no federal monies are allowed to go to abortion services at all. So yeah. any funding that Planned Parenthood gets does not actually go to abortion services. Okay. Um, whether or not that's right or wrong, I just think that's an important fact to share with mm -hmm. folks. Actually, uh, abortion services are only 3% of what Planned Parenthood does nationally. Um, and I think to pull back, what's important about the Planned Parenthood defunding is that we're talking about people, especially low-income people, having access to things like pap smears, breast screening, cervical cancer, all of this kind of stuff is actually what is at stake when Planned Parenthood is defunded. Mm -hmm. And again, particularly for poor people who are going to have worse health outcomes and less preventive care. Mm -hmm. So to your question about whether Planned Parenthood's uh, reaction was appropriate um, yeah. in really having a strong campaign against their own defunding, I don't think it's just self-interest that's motivating them. I think that they do the work that they do because they know no one else will serve the communities that they serve. Okay. And especially if you're threatening things like the ACA, you're talking about the, the most marginalized parts of the population losing access to basic health care that they only can get at Planned Parenthood, especially without insurance. Mm -hmm. And aside from withholding federal funding, are there any other ways that a president can affect abortion policy? Well, especially in this climate, I'm sure one of the biggest things you guys have thought about um, is not, you know, so a president can do things like an executive order to affect yeah. uh, international policy. The greatest power that this president has, especially during this term, given the ages of our Supreme Court justices, is mm -hmm. to appoint Supreme Court justices yes. who can make We're going to get into that. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll continue. Uh, so I think that, that idea about what impact the president can have on abortion policy in particular, certainly we see things like the global gag rule, um, but I'd say the biggest thing is setting a climate and a, a, a a national tenor where a discussion in Congress can be had about defunding Planned Parenthood. State legislators suddenly feel open to have these kinds mm -hmm. of discussions. The other thing I would say that's fascinating about this president um, in particular, so we know like for instance he has done things that would suggest that perhaps he doesn't value science and facts. Okay. Um, even something like you know his, his counselor uh, Kellyanne Conway talking about alternative facts. So when mm -hmm. it comes to things like science, uh, these are the ways we hopefully hope that healthcare is informed. So if, if I say, you know, having access to, let's say, birth control is going to be good for my health because it regulates all of this stuff, yeah. I would usually point to some research to back that up. This president has, I mean, even things like he's going to reduce, he suggested a reduction of the budget for the EPA by 31% and has asked for them to delete facts that don't agree with his yeah. own personal assessments mm -hmm. of science. So when you have this kind of climate that's anti-research and anti-science, it sets back I think what people think is possible um, and what kinds of objective assessments we'd usually make through through science and data. So that's another thing I think he's, he can set a tone and a tenor where we can ignore things like basic health research for good health outcomes um, because as far as his administration cons is concerned, it seems like ideology might be more important than science. But okay. again, that's only speaking in my personal capacity. Yeah. And you mentioned it before, the Supreme Court Justice. So mm -hmm. after a lively battle, Neil Gorsuch has been confirmed as a Supreme Court Justice. 
Now, many pro-choicers were against him taking the seat, fearing that it could reboot the 25-year campaign to chip away at abortion rights. Mm -hmm. Do you have the same fear? Do you believe that abortion rights could be in jeopardy under this president? Speaking only as a lawyer, I believe strongly that something that's incredibly important to hold on to is the impartiality of the court. Yeah. And for all the things that Gorsuch has done, how he rules when he sits in that seat ideally will not be based on political lines. Mm -hmm. um, and I do think it's important, I think, for us as Americans to remember that the Trump presidency, whether it's four years or eight years or however, um, you know, if something unforeseen should happen prior to that, regardless, the judiciary is a different branch. Yeah. And so how the judiciary operates, thankfully, is completely separate than how the executive branch operates. So what this president does, um, you know, what's really wonderful about Supreme Court justices is they are tenured for life. They can choose to retire. Uh, the decisions that they make, they're mm -hmm. not beholden to that political structure when they do make them. So I think for Justice Gorsuch, I, we cannot anticipate how he is going to rule truly because yeah. he has not yet ruled. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to, as an American and as someone who believes in the democratic process, I want to believe that we shouldn't judge him until we see his decisions Yeah, come him to getting into office and what he implements. Yeah. And then you mentioned that too, because he's, get, he's never directly ruled on abortion rights. Mm -hmm. And in his confirmation hearing, he explicitly stated that if Trump asked him to vote to repeal Roe versus Wade, he would have walked out the door. Mm -hmm. So you believe that under Gorsuch, at this point, does he look like an objective candidate or one that may be towards party lines? Well, I think we can sometimes look at how justices have voted once they're on the bench. Yeah. We have seen an increasingly political court. Mm -hmm. Usually you can say, you know, these justices we imagine will go this way and these justices the other way. And again, as a lawyer, I always remind folks, we only do that like, you know, these five are gonna go this way, these four mm -hmm. the other way. We only see those on the biggest cases, um, yeah. the cases that often are the most controversial. So the idea of liberal and conservative justices, I don't think we should out of the gate just be like, well, they belong to a party and they're always gonna vote along a party mm -hmm. line. Um, and so, yeah, to your question, I don't think that we should judge him until he has made his decisions. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I think, you, and that's not even me being political. I honestly think that you see amazing thing ha things happen. Like I always try to raise the example of we talk about Earl Warren, who is yeah. the, just, the justice that um, was responsible for the decision, Brown v. Board of Education, mm -hmm. that integrated public schools. And when you think about the Warren court, you think absolutely one of the most progressive, wonderful courts um, in the sense of, of going maybe against old constitutional law. We're in a country where slavery was legal by yes. the Constitution. So mm -hmm. to make this sweeping statement that the Constitution would embrace integration is a shocking kind mm -hmm. of departure from what the Constitution yes. actually says. So you, know, you think Earl Warren, he's absolutely a standout candidate for a political actor. Well, Earl Warren, when he was Attorney General of California, was for Japanese internment. So if I had told you, you know, that this guy who had previously been for, attorney, uh, for internment of Japanese people purely based on their national origin mm. or racial background, would have voted to integrate schools. You yeah. would have been shocked, right? Mm -hmm. So I, I say that, I think, because I'm an optimist, but I also, as a lawyer, I trust that when we look at the law, we think about the law no, not only aspirationally, mm -hmm. and honestly not even as activists, but we try to embrace what the spirit of the law actually was intended for. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's flexibility there, and I, this, you know, Gorsuch is on the court, and we should see what happens from yes, here. Yes, anything is possible at this point. <laughs> yeah. So do you think that Roe versus Wade is in danger? So we're going to go back to that a little bit. So do you think that with this presidency, it may not be changed within these next four to eight years, mm -hmm. or we could definitely see a major shift? I think we're going to see a lot of challenges. So mm -hmm. the way that this works is that, you know, you have precedent that's set, and the way that Roe versus Wade has been dealt with in over the, it will, since it's uh, coming to pass the opinion in, in 1973, was that basically forces who would like to roll back Roe v. Wade have tried every method possible to say, well, this constitutional right exists, but we'd like to roll back your access to that right. Yeah. Um, so for instance, when we talk about the Hyde Amendment, that's actually saying, well, uh, Henry Hyde, when he actually was, was having the, discussing the amendment on the floor, uh, said, I would really love to ban, I, this is not verbatim, but the idea was, I wish I could stop rich women from having abortions and poor women having abortions, but unfortunately the only vehicle available to me is the Medicaid bill, meaning mm -hmm. I can only affect poor women. Um, and so the idea was, you're basically seeing this play out where any way we can chip away at the right, we are. And so basically if I can't change your constitutional right, I'd like to change your access to that right. Did you, uh, do you know about the Supreme Court case that happened, I think it was last June, uh, on about abortion rights? Elaborate. Okay, so yeah. there's a case called Whole Woman's Health v. Heller okay. v. Hellerstedt, and that was about a set of laws in Texas. Um, and those laws were, like we talked about with mm -hmm. science, they were ostensibly to protect women's health. This, okay. um, yeah. And so HB2 were the, 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 the bill in the law that was under consideration. 
um, what they actually had as part of the regulations wasn't like, oh, these abortions are that are being performed are unsafe or anything like that. In fact, abortion is safer than a shot of penicillin. Um, and I was just hearing a, a doctor um, for Physicians for Reproductive Health speak recently that apparently abortions are safer than running a marathon when you look at your body. Mm -hmm. um, and so these are just contextual points. But the big thing is uh, whole women's health was about what turned out to be false junk science about yeah. women's health being compromised by them trying to get abortions. And so I use that as an example. These bills would do things like uh, say, well, if you're going to be in a clinic um, where you're doing a surgical procedure that takes no more than five minutes or giving someone an abortion pill that they are going to go home and actually experience the abortion with, we're still going to use this opportunity to regulate things like how, how wide are your hallways, how big are your janitorial closets, um, and other kinds of things that actually had no impact on the quality of care mm -hmm. being given to people. So they were using these workarounds to try to cut back at the constitutional right um, while still saying that they were protecting women's health, which was just false. Mm -hmm. So the reason I bring that up is because we're not even having a conversation anymore about whether abortion should or should not be constitutional. It is constitutional, and the way that it's been attacked in the courts is by picking up every possible other little way that we can chip away at the right. So to that extent, Roe v. Wade has been chipped away at mm -hmm. um, by a line of cases that you know we can talk about. And uh, I think the place that we're in now is basically gonna invite more challenges to for people who are, are basically against the constitutional right to mm -hmm. abortion. Um, and one of the things that I wanted to bring up about the safety of abortion, mm -hmm. we have Norma McCorvey, who was Roe in Roe versus Wade, mm -hmm. switched her position mm -hmm. and then said that she was against abortion because it harmed uh, women. Mm -hmm. So if the very woman who was Roe in Roe versus mm -hmm. Wade is coming out and saying that she regrets having this happen and then she feels that this is a risk to women, mm -hmm. what impact do you think that it had on the case and do you think that there's legitimacy to that argument? I think a lot of people don't actually know about that change yeah. that occurred for um, mm -hmm. I was surprised Jane when I found that out. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And I think she's a really interesting case and I mm -hmm. think She's also got a, a bunch of other changes that happened in her life um, and really some difficult circumstances that brought her to the abortion in the first case. The only reason I think it's even worth it to discuss her case in particular yeah. is that every abortion is its own abortion. Mm -hmm. um, and for that, again, coming back to science, mm -hmm. right? We've seen in some later opinions, I think it was Justice Kennedy talking about uh, women coming to regret their abortion. And again, doing polling and data about the majority of women who have had abortions and their immediate relief or their immediate immediate feeling afterward, I'm pretty sure that the number one most reported feeling is relief. And I think this is an example of where it's really important to interrogate what our data is versus what we anecdotally think. Like mm -hmm. there's actually a study that just came out of NYU recently um, that was about the fact that the people who have abortions are least likely to tell someone else if they think that other person is anti-choice. And it turns out that the thing that we think is most likely to change someone's mind mm -hmm. about whether abortions are okay is if they know somebody who has had an abortion. Okay. So if you are, you know, you're my uncle and I mm -hmm. know that I think you are never gonna accept me and the only thing that's gonna make you change your mind about abortion is knowing that I had an abortion, yeah. we're kind of at an impasse because we're not creating a space to actually mm -hmm. have that conversation. So if I think, I don't know if it's a helpful analog that you think about the change that's occurred in the last 10 years toward LGBT rights and things like marriage equality or gay marriage in the United States. The biggest factor that seems to change people's mind about accepting that as an option is going, oh gosh, I didn't know my nephew was gay, my neighbor is gay, mm -hmm. somebody who goes to church with me is gay. And so if abortion is kind of kept in the closet in the same way, even though this is a thing that uh, I think the, the data has changed a little bit recently, but by all accounts, we can basically say one in three American women is going to have an abortion in her lifetime or mm -hmm. has had an abortion. That means one in three women that you know has definitely had an mm -hmm. abortion. And opening up the space to talk about that, I think, mm -hmm. creates a change in how we perceive it. And I had two specific questions there sure. relating to abortion. So does NYAAF or you personally, do you believe that there should be a trimester limit on abortion or should it be at any point in the pregnancy? I think ab every abortion is a different abortion. And okay. I think this is where government regulation that is without, again, the objective, mm -hmm. right, mm -hmm. is both to be able to preserve t autonomy, but also to make people, allow people to have healthy decisions. Okay. Um, and so we don't have, as NIAF and also me personally, because of the things that I've seen and the stories I've mm -hmm. heard both medically and personally, mm -hmm. um, there isn't a clear line about where. Mm -hmm. Well, outside of a medical speaking, let's say, should there be a trimester limit? I don't think there is a way to talk about abortions yeah, okay. by saying it's outside of a medical context. Like actually mm -hmm. most people don't know. So 90% of abortions occur within the first trimester, mm -hmm. right? So actually I think a lot of people don't know that. So when Donald Trump, for instance, was in the debates and talking about babies being ripped from the womb, there is no universe in which that uh, that type of abortion exists. And to me it was a real pity because it's an example of someone talking about a healthcare procedure with zero 
uh, zero evident knowledge of that healthcare procedure. Mm -hmm. So 90% of abortions are occurring in the first trimester. Um, and beyond that, the vast majority of late-term abortions that do occur are because of genetic abnormalities. Okay. We're talking about risks to the life mm -hmm. of the mother, but also the child will not survive. I've talked to people um, on my own experience, in my own experience with NIAF, where I'm servicing the hotline, where mm. I have people who are saying, I, this was very much a wanted pregnancy. If I deliver this child, it will already be dead, mm -hmm. or it is, it is dead in my womb, and mm -hmm. I wish I could have it, but I cannot. And there is no universe in which I would look at that person and say, yeah. well, you know, I've mm -hmm. decided because I, with no health knowledge mm -hmm. and no, n and just my personal ideology, I'm going to dictate what your personal mm -hmm. situation should be. Yeah, well, just a clarification from mm -hmm. earlier, I meant like threat to the mother or the child's health, like just situations in which the, the pregnancy has to be terminated for personal reasons. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. Elaborate. So like, let's say because of financial status or security, they mm -hmm. have to like terminate the pregnancy outside of let's say it's gonna threaten the mother's health. Okay. Then should there be a trimester limit or something? But we elaborated on that and okay. so. Okay, got mm -hmm. it. So I wanted to go into now that the US president has not explicitly said that he wants to make abortion illegal in the US. He simply said that he would like to turn the decision making uh, on, on abortion rights to the states. Mm -hmm. What is wrong with that? Analyzing it at the state level or deciding on it at the state level rather than at the federal level? Um, there are a couple of things. It depends on how much time we have, Zion. Yeah, well, go in, go into it. But the biggest, uh, the biggest problem with allowing, punting it back to the states, as it were, is that we're talking about a constitutional right. Mm -hmm. And the Constitution is a document that applies to the entire United States. Mm -hmm. And the thing that feels most dangerous to me about punting it back to the states and allowing it to be a state decision is that when we come to constitutional rights, what we're talking about are rights that are so fundamental that they should never be jeopardized by the decision of state legislators or other citizens or anything like that. We're talking about what makes us American and what is what our Constitution has decided mm -hmm. is part of our fundamental freedoms. I think it's also really important when we talk about states' rights to remember what the origins of those arguments are. So states' rights in the United States, especially when we were basically coming out of an era transitioning from slavery and out of segregation, yeah. was the way that we were able to without having to say it out loud, say we would like to be able to make decisions about whether we are slave-owning territories, mm -hmm. and then a hundred years later, whether we believe in integration, whether yeah. we believe in interracial marriage, all of those things, we were not able to, s we didn't have to say these are about us denying other people their constitutional rights because mm -hmm. we could instead say, let's leave it up to the states. Even to the decision that was made in Obergefell, the idea that states should be allowed to make that decision about whether gay marriage should be con legal was essentially saying, I, won't, I don't want you to have this constitutional right and to have the equality and freedom that the Constitution actually guarantees you. So I want to put abortion rights, if the Constitution has been interpreted by the Supreme Court mm -hmm. to suggest that abortion is a constitutional right, then it seems like that should hold as much weight as any other constitutional right. And as a country that has made mistakes in the past, and to often turn to states' rights to be able to, to allow us to rob other people of their constitutional rights, the fact that that's the place that the president goes um, that to, to push it back to the states seems to me like it's a dangerous next point in that continuum. And on the issue of constitutional rights, do you believe that the child that is being awarded in the situation has any constitutional rights? I think when, when a fetus becomes a child is a question that should be left up to science. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think ultimately this is one of the trickiest questions because you are talking about when constitutional rights attach. Mm -hmm. um, and then again, even from an originalist standpoint, which is when we actually look to interpreting mm -hmm. the Constitution through how the founding fathers would have looked at it, it's not the, not the view that I take personally okay. because uh, the founding fathers were slaveholders. And so if you are an originalist interpreter, you would never allow for the end of slavery to be something that could have been fathomed by the Constitution. Mm -hmm. But that's a separate, separate yeah. conversation. Um, but even under an originalist interpretation, states didn't adopt statutes to to criminalize abortion until well after the Constitution itself had been written. So this is a new invention to be able to criminalize this behavior for doctors or for women or anything like that. Um, and so to come back to your question about when rights attached, there is no universe except a scientific one where we would be able to say, this is not about a person who actually autonomously has control over, over their own body. Mm -hmm. And until a life is viable outside of the womb, you can have a different conversation. But prior to that point, I think rights attached to the person who mm -hmm. has been the rights bearer up to that point. And what is the particular position on NYAAF, NIAF, or you personally mm -hmm. about when life begins? I don't know that I have an answer to that. Okay. I certainly don't have it for NIAF, and mm -hmm. I don't have it for me. And again, I think the reason that, the reason this is not a political answer, it's dealing with what the reality is, as I've seen it as a reproductive justice mm -hmm. advocate, both with NIAF, but also as a lawyer, and as someone who's worked on the ground in several different countries on this kind of issue, 
we don't even get to these nice questions or interesting philosophical questions because what we're dealing with is somebody was pregnant, they thought they couldn't tell their father, they went to a butcher, and now mm -hmm. after being butchered is le literally left in a trench to die and to bleed out. And so when you're talking about those are the consequences of the worst kinds of, the lack of safe medical care mm -hmm. has incredible consequences. Banning abortion has consequences like that that I am aware of and have written about. Mm -hmm knowing that that's at stake, I'm not willing to engage in the philosophical niceties. Often, as we saw at that bill signing, with a room of men who have never experienced abortion and probably haven't spoken to people in their lives who have had abortions mm -hmm. about what that experience actually was like. This is in no way to say that that's not an important question, but I think it's a philosophical question that should be left as completely distinct from one that has real health and medical implications for people all across this country and mm -hmm. in the world. And I was gonna ask you that question. Do you think that that is a legitimate argument that abortion should be legalized because there could be women who go out and have unsafe ones that are a threat to their health. That it's not even a legitimate argument, it's the reality. Mm -hmm. So it's not even an argument, honestly, because here's the thing, I mm -hmm. think we think that we legislate, we can make abortion go away. What we've actually seen, like you look at the climate prior mm -hmm. to Roe v. Wade, the reason that abortion was so dangerous was not because abortion is inherently dangerous, it was incredibly dangerous because people lacked access to safe abortions. Okay. So legal abortion allows abortion, like any other medical procedure, to be regulated, to be conducted by people who have knowledge that are able to do it, um, and to give people instructions about wh how they will know that things are going okay or not okay. In a climate where abortion was a back alley uh, practice, of course it was going to be more unsafe for women. And so if you really care about women and you care about the health of their children, um, it is imperative that you provide them access, legal access to safe health care. Um, and I think this is also really important. The picture that we have often, like one of the reasons that a lot of women do have abortions um, is because they're already mothers. And so for the care of their family, I think the s statistic is something like 61% of women who have abortions are already mothers. And these are often decisions, 82, according to Guttmacher Institute, 82% um, of women who are having abortions have had conversations and have the support of their partner in making that decision. So this is not this picture of this like shady woman going into an alley and making a decision alone. This is a decision that often mothers are making in, t in tandem with their partners um, about what will affect their family and what's for the well-being of their family. Uh, and not mm -hmm. to say that there's mm -hmm. a right abortion, but just the idea is that this is not like Regulating abortion out of existence will only increase the instances of unsafe abortion. And if you care about women and you care about children, you should not allow that to happen. And then do you think that abortion should be legal no matter what? Do you think, w are you willing to compromise or are people in your circle, like say NIAF, are willing to compromise on legislation like meet the right on the issue halfway? We need to talk about it. We mm -hmm. absolutely need to talk about it. I don't stick my, I am absolutely not going to be intransigent about anything because mm -hmm. I think it's important to have conversations like this, about what does it actually mean. I often find that having a conversation, like that idea, that stat, that 90% of abortions are occurring in the first trimester, I think is really important for folks to know. And I'm sure there are stats that are coming from the other side that, they th that I sh would know and would maybe mm -hmm. affect my opinion. And so I'm not gonna say that I have a hard line one way or another, and this is certainly not speaking for NIAF, this is only in okay. my, my capacity. Again, I think, what all we say, there's a saying in the law, bad, uh, what is it, good law, good, Hard cases make for bad law. Okay. So you have this, the instances that are always going to be heartbreakers, that's actually not the majority of the instances that are occurring. Mm -hmm. And so to stick on the most extreme examples, whether it's pro-life people or pro-choice people, um, often doesn't actually get to the reality of what's going on. So I think it's imperative that we all be willing to have dialogues and actually meet each other, or at least hear each other out. Um, but I think that's separate than when, in this particular conversation, the responsibility of the government is to protect the health and well-being of its citizens. And I think to limit their options is anathema to the Constitution and to their own well-being, um, and frankly is kind of abdicating responsibility to have a conversation and create protections for citizens under the Constitution. And I read an article that said that the pro-life movement has never been stronger. What are your thoughts on this? The pro-life movement has never, well, do you think the pro-life movement has gained strength in the past few months, I'll say, under Donald Trump? I think they have, I th that's such an impossible thing to quantify. I think it's interesting to even think that the pro-life movement has never been stronger for exactly the reason that we were talking about. People who have been pro-choice have often been quiet. And mm -hmm. whether you're, 
I might not even identify as pro-choice, but I know that I've had, if, if I am uh, yeah. hypothetical, if I'm someone who's had an abortion and I don't identify as pro-choice, maybe I've never thought about whether I am pro-choice or not. This is mm -hmm. also really fascinating. We're seeing the first generation. I think April of last year was the first time that millennials were the largest voting cohort, right? Mm -hmm. Millennials, 1980 or onward, you know, yeah. count your count a little bit flexibly. They're the first group of people who have grown up in a post Roe v. Wade society. Mm -hmm. So you often talk to people, or rather when I speak to people who are from, from older generations, they are absolutely hell bent on me knowing about what rights they won for us. Mm -hmm. Whereas I get to grow up in an environment where I take for granted that I have bodily autonomy yeah. and control. So I think you see a lot of people, it's really interesting how it plays out even in this fight with young women today about whether they identify as feminist. Because I think they don't come from a climate where it was preposterous that they would be able to be in the workplace, right? Would be able to go to college at, high, at, high, at higher rates than men even. Um, they take for granted, I think, and myself included, a lot of the rights that people before us had to fight for. And so I think the idea that the pro-life movement has never been stronger, I think, probably could be answered by the Women's March, which I think by all accounts is actually one of the largest marches, at least globally, mm. in history, um, for where particularly women and people who care for women for the first time realized what could potentially be at stake here. When you have a president who is literally saying things like, mm -hmm. it's okay to grab women by the pussy, whether that was in a private context or not, mm -hmm. the idea that that could come out of someone's mouth when they were going to be president is, is shocking, frankly. Mm -hmm. And I think that's important for us to discuss as a society is what does this actually mean about what our respect is for people who are women and their basic fundamental equity? Um, never mind saying things like, I think people who get abortion should be punished. Mm -hmm. And I don't say that to be sensational. I'm saying I think we should be honest and open brokers about the kinds of, the level of dialogue that's actually happening. So whether whether or not they have been more strong in the past, they are certainly very vocal. And I think to your question about what is, what is the power of the president, the yeah. president is able to set a tenor. Um, and I think it's our responsibility as citizens, if we don't accept that, that climate, to be vocal in return. Mm -hmm. Set the tone for what his term is going to be. Yeah. So, well, not to get too philosophical in nature, but in one of our final questions I wanted to ask, you believe abortion is the matter of a woman's right to choose or the rights of the child, if it is determined to be one. It's, it's a complex interpretation question. Mm -hmm. Matter of a woman's right to choose or the rights of the unborn child. I wish I had the luxury to get to think about things like that. Mm. I don't know. I think children outside of the womb absolutely have rights. And mm -hmm. I think women are not just incubators. And I think, again, every, abor every medical decision is a complex medical decision. And maybe I'll flip it back at you. I would be happy to answer that question if we would be able to ask the same questions about whether uh, a vasectomy is, the matter, uh, is a matter of the potential child or a menstrual cycle is a matter of a potential mm -hmm. child, right? So a woman who chooses to, uh, you know, go through a hysterectomy or a man who chooses to have a vasectomy, at what point do we push back and say, you know, honestly, even we're seeing some state states offering bills about saying men shouldn't be allowed to have ejaculate outside of, of the sexual act because mm -hmm. you are, are potentially compromising a child. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that these are, are great solutions from a regulatory state standpoint. Yeah. I just think that when we ask these questions, we silo this specific issue of of a fetus or you know the potentiality of life without thinking about what the long continuum is and I don't have an answer for them philosophically because as a lawyer and as a person and as a member of this organization the New York Abortion Access Fund I'm dealing with the practical realities of this and when somebody mm -hmm. calls me and says I'm in a domestic violence situation and I don't have the funding to be able to have this done and I know that my life will be in danger if I have this child can you help that's not a great time for me to say hey well let me, let me really think about whether I believe you should have access to your constitutional rights or not and mm -hmm. I think I have a role to play for that particular question for that particular person, and that's why I'm here, and that's why I'm a part of the organization I am. And I'll say the final question for this forum here right now is, if you had anything to say to President Trump or to the anti-abortion side, what would you say? To say, to appeal for the rights of women, to appeal for the rights of choice, what would you say? I would probably say, if you could take the time to sit down in a room alone, mm -hmm six women who you love and ask them whether they've ever ex had an experience with abortion themselves or anyone else they love um, if they would be willing to talk about that with you and I would in I would entreat those people to honestly earnestly and openly listen to the answers that they got well Ms. Hera thank you so much for joining us today and this has been a great dialogue today's show may be over but the fight on reproductive rights continues how will reproductive rights fare under President Trump only time will tell 
But for now, I'm Zion Decoto. This has been an MNN special. Thank you so much for joining us.